So we're beginning a new series this morning and I'm so excited because I've got no idea how long we're going to be with James, busy with James. And uh, uh, it's, it's really an honor to have this opportunity as a minister to study and to have the time. I know everyone works and, and um, to have the time to study and go through James and all the details and things and it's really a blessing for me as well. Many years ago, uh, a pastor in, in um, Kruifontein asked me, what, is the, what, what do you like the most about, pre- about preaching? And still today, I haven't changed my mind, it's the preparation. It's always the preparation, because that is the time God deals with me. That is the time I, I search the scriptures and I discover truths. And God is busy working with me. So I pray that this series will be a great blessing to you. And also tonight, don't miss tonight if you want to come. Five o'clock, we'll stick to the time, five to six. I've actually had, I said to Dick, I've got seven main points. And I I'm, I'm, don't think we're going to get through two of them. Uh, when it comes to what the biblical gift of tongues is. So we'll probably have to have a sequel. And uh, go into that again. I'm not going to do something strange to you. Don't worry about that. This is a Baptist church. (laughs) We're going to look at what the Bible teaches on this controversial issue. And um, I just thought when I was preparing also for this, as uh, Galatians 4.16, Paul says, Have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? And this is one of those topics I've made enemies before many but i'm glad this is a baptist church not a pentecostal church because i met enemies over there because of what the truth and i believe if you see these things it will really be a blessing if you if you understand what the bible teaches on on this topic and there's no confusion about that so i want to invite you to come tonight five o'clock and um we'll have a wonderful time together um james one Okay, we're up and running. So, I've decided the theme of this series to be faith that works. Because if you think about the book of James, you hear faith works. That's the main theme going through the book. And you'll see this in different forms. So, this is, James is where the rubber meets the road. It's a very practical book. Um, And how do we live our faith out? How do we live it out? And what happens when we go through tough times? What happens when things are not going as we anticipate? And I bet there is more than one person here who also has struggled before in life. Am I the only one? Everyone here? Okay, so I'm going to talk to the right people this morning. So James is a very practical practical book. And my prayer for us and for you and for me, uh, for me, is that we, through this series, will learn truths in this book that will help us and also apply these truths in our lives so that we can really be what God wants us to be. And I think that that's the main, main, main purpose of this. So James chapter 1 verse 1, let's start reading at verse 1. I'm only going to do verse 1 to 4. Only 4 verses. Wonderful. Okay, so. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials and various kinds. Verse 3. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and then verse 4 and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing let's just bow our heads and pray ask the Lord for guidance Father God we thank you this morning for your word I pray that you open up this word for us I pray that you we will learn and that through this we will know you more that we will have more of you, Lord. And in this we pursue you, Lord. And you change us. 
transform us in the likeness and in the image of Christ our Savior. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Okay, so James, James begin with a, sal a salutation. That's what they call it. Salutation? Yeah. Yeah. So it's felt? Die woord. Ah, the kids. I forgot. There's kids here this morning. And the word that you have to count is the word suffering. Suffering. What are you going to tell me? Suffering. So you, every time you hear the word suffering or sufferings, plural, you can count. Is it right? At the end, you can go to the cell. She will see if you're right and you will get a, a sweetie for that. Okay, so James begin with a salutation and there's two main ideas in this verse. Firstly, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first idea that we get in this verse. And the second idea is to the 12 tribes in the dispersion greeting. So let's explore this and I want to go a little bit into this. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the Greek word for servant is the word doulos. That means slave. It literally means slave. Now, many translations translated as servant, bond servant, Afrikaans, dienstnag, van die heren. But doulos in Greek means slave. There's a different word in Greek for, for servant. And it's very interesting why the translation translators translated most of them to the word servant. And I think it's because of this idea that we have of a slave. It's a very repulsive idea or a, a bad idea. And we don't want to associate a Christian as a slave. But remember when this was written it was written in a time of slavery. So the people, the Greek people, exactly knew what doulos meant. Slave. It means, um, doulos means slave. Now the word for, for sermon is the word diakonos. Afrikaans, diakon. English, deacon. That's where the word deacon comes from. So those who are deacons, that's what it means to be a deacon. You are a servant. You are serving. And Dulos slave. Now I've, I, I did fa fa found a few translations that translated Dulos with slave. For instance, the Holman Christian Standard Bible. I don't know if anyone has one uh, like that. Common English Bible, the CEB, or the New Living Translation. Do you have an even Living Translation? I remember they actually translated it as slave. Now, if I'm correct, there's only one translation that every time you find the word doulos in the Bible, it means slave, and that's kito. Now, I don't have it with me, but um, uh, it's not a very familiar one. So, slave means, um, not doulos means slave, not bondservant, not servant, it's slave. Why? Now, why is this so significant? Why am I hammering on this? Because in the big scheme of things, in God's universe and His creation and our relationship with Him, we, James, viewed himself as a slave of God. And so did Paul. So did Peter. So did Timothy. So did James and Jude and John. So I've got a few scriptures just to show you. Romans 1 verse 1. Now, every time I got, got the word doulos, I changed it with, not, not servant, I changed it to slave because that's what it actually means. So, in Romans 1 verse 1, how does Paul present himself? Paul, a slave. slave of Christ. A doulos of Christ. 2 Peter 1 verse 1, Simon, a Simon Peter, is Simeon or Simon? Simon. Simon. Simeon, Peter. Simeon. Simeon, Peter. A doulos, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. That's how he viewed himself. Philippians 1 verse 1. Paul and Timothy, uh, Tim uh, uh, Timotheus, Timothy, the douloi. Now that's just a plural form of doulos. 
the douloi, the slaves of Jesus Christ. Paul, Peter, Timothy viewed themselves in their relationship with God as slaves. Revelation 1 verse 1. John, to his slave. Jude 1 verse 1. Jude 1 verse 1 says, Jude the doulos, the slave of Jesus Christ. And then also Philippians. And if you ever think it's beneath, your, beneath you to be called a slave of God, listen to what Philippians 1 verse, uh, 2 verse 7 says. It says, do I have 2 verse 7 there? No, no it's, it's 1 verse 1. It's not 1 verse 1, it's 2 verse 7. Sorry, that's a mistake. 2 verse 7 says, Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a slave. To loss. Jesus took taking on a form of a slave. Why is this so significant? Now, I don't want to go too much in this because it's very important to be yourself in your relationship to God as a slave. Why? Because, number one, slave is owned by God. A slave was bought with a price. What did Jesus do? He bought us with His blood. We are owned by Him. Mm. Secondly, He belongs to... Well, secondly, a slave does not earn a salary. Did you know that? A servant earned a salary. A servant went to work worked and then he got the salary you're all servants of this wonderful world that you live in okay you work for a salary you go home and you can resign you can actually quit your job okay a slave can't a slave doesn't earn a salary his master provides for him his master gives him a, a, a roof over his head his master gives him food to eat and his family and, and you must just remember in the biblical times even those times there were good slaves and bad uh, good masters and bad masters you also, it, sometimes it was a very good thing to be a slave because that master will look, very, look really good after you so it's not always a bad thing and uh, his master owns him his master cares for him his master provides gives protection but you know what the difference is with God and us? God makes His slaves His sons and daughters. God makes His sons and daughters His co-heads. And one day we will also sit with Christ in heaven. Isn't that wonderful? He makes us cohere. So James begins this letter by saying, James, a slave, if you see that servant, it's a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, 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 could, have be, he could have begin the letter with saying, James, the half-brother or the bro brother of Jesus, maybe get some credit. He, he could have started because he was the brother of Christ but he doesn't view himself in that light. He views himself as a slave of God. And Christ did not refer to himself as Jesus' brother or as the church leader from, of Jerusalem church because he was one of the first leaders in the Jerusalem church. And it is evident that his purpose was not to know Jesus after the flesh According to 2 Corinthians 5.16, he didn't want to know Jesus after, according to the flesh, but only as his Lord and his God. That was his purpose. That's the first part of the verse that we get. The second part of the verse says, To the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Okay, so he's writing a pastoral letter to the first Jewish Christians. Now, I've read a few commentaries on this. There's very different views on this. But it just makes sense. Because when James was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Okay. The first 
Christians, the first believers were Jews. Jews. They were the first believers of the church. And they were going undergoing hardship. The first believers of the church um, in, in, in Acts 10 to 11, we only find the first Gentile being saved and his family Cornelius. But before that, James was writing to Jewish Christians who were persecuted, who were scattered all over the place because of Saul. Paul. Remember the story? Let's go to Acts 8. And let me read that. We read about the dispersion in Acts 8. Verse 1 says, And Saul approved of his execution. Saul who became Paul. That is, this is when Saul was persecuting the church. And uh, Saul approved of his e execution. He, he is Stephen. Remember Stephen who was martyred? And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison this is what happening with the first believers jewish believers who became christians and james was the leader he's writing to them to encourage them because they were scattered throughout they were poor and they struggled and he is writing to them to encourage them and this also dates the book kind of very early that's why james might be at the end but it's actually one of the earliest books that we have in the new testament so the dispersion is the jewish christians scattered all over the place and um let me just show you the word for dispersion the greek word for dispersion is Diaspora. Have you heard about that word? Now, I don't want to break it up because we all know diaspora, seed, actually refers to to be sown. Diaspora is to be sown, to be like seed thrown over all the places, scattered all over. And that's what happened. Now, just something interesting. What happened? In Acts 8, in the next verse, verse 4, it says, Now who those who were scattered, not referring to the apostles, he said the apostles stayed behind. Those who were scattered, what did they do? They went out preached. preaching the word. Wasn't the apostles. It was the persecuted Christians that spread the word of God and it became like a wildfire spread. I'm intentionally saying this because we kind of see that the, it's the pastor's job to spread the news. It's your job to tell people about Jesus. So everywhere they went, they preached the word. And because of this dispersion, the gospel spread from Jerusalem, just as Acts 1 verse 8 said, you will receive power from above and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria and the ends of the world. That's what's happening in Acts 8. God brought the dispersion. So persecution might, and this, when we read James, we must have in mind that sufferings yeah. sufferings is not always against God's will. Remember that. And sometimes I, we should ask God to send something to get us out of our comfort zones so that the Word of God can 
spread. So the 12 tribes referring to the first believers who were Jewish was scattered all over the place. Further, it would be, and I want to add this comment, it would be unnatural to take the 12 tribes and say it refers to the new Israel or it refers to the church symbolically as some people interpret it. I read a commentator that said the 12 tribes refers to 12 mountains and is symbolically the mountains of the world. And so he kind of plays around with that, but I think it's far-fetched. Simply means the first Jewish Christians, the 12 tribes, those who were saved, scattered, and the word of God was spread. But all these truths that we read that James is writing to the first Jewish Christians is also true for the church as a whole for us today. Because in the church of Christ there is no distinction. Romans 10, 10 verse 12. There is no distinction between Jew, Gentile. We are the same. It's the same Lord over all. So this letter is also for us. It's for us as believers. Since it was written for that body of Christians in that time that existed, this letter is also applicable to our lives, to every one of us. So let's run ahead and go to James 1 verse 2. And this is where it becomes interesting. James 1 verse 2 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Okay, just, just see what James... James is not saying, count it joy on my brothers, if you meet trials. He's not saying, if it will happen. He's saying, when it will happen. When it comes. And you have to realize this. As a Christian, you are not free from trials and sufferings. As a Christian, you are not free from storms. Every believer will have to face difficulties and sufferings in their lives. Of some kind. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. When Peter also speaks of the inevitable ability of trials. We read in chapter 4 verse 12, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Oh, I just gave my life to the Lord. I'm so happy. Two weeks later, bam, something happened. Huh? What's this? Be surprised. Do not be surprised when sufferings happen. In fact, Jesus also said in John 16, 33, you can check me up. He says that then in this world, you shall have tribulation. You shall. It's a given fact. Thank you, Lord, that we're not alone in that. Oh, this Christian thing, I don't like it anymore. You know what? If you want to struggle without God, go ahead. I'll rather struggle with God. And now in verse, th uh, in verse 2, he says, When you meet trials of various kinds, now the King James Version says, When you fall, into various trials. That's a more of a correct translation. When you fall into. Now there's a big difference between falling into trials or walking into trials. And let's be honest with each other. Many of the difficulties, many of the sufferings in our lives we face is simply our own fault. There's no one to blame for them except ourselves. But there is also those difficulties that we fall into. We didn't choose it. It just sneak up on us 
and nothing that we do. So how do we deal with trials? How do we deal with suffering? How do we deal with these difficulties? And James starts off by suggesting a very strange, unusual response. He says, count it all joy. joy. James says, rejoice. It's easy to rejoice when everything is going well. When everything, you feel blessed and, and everything is good. When good things come your way, it's very easy to rejoice in that. Amen? But when the tough times come, when everything seems to be going wrong, it's just not natural. A natural response to be joyful. A natural response would be to be angry, be in despair, to complain, or even like Jonah, run away. So when you see someone who is struggling in grief, you don't normally say, Oh brother, consider it joy, my brother. And as, as he's weeping and sharing about his trials, you don't say, Oh brother, pure joy. <laughs> pure joy. We don't naturally do that. Although we should. <laughs> just feels wrong. Right? But what should our response be? What should our response be when we are in tough times? Well, in fact, the word count is in the middle deponent form. Now, who's English? Grammar? The middle deponent form, for those who are clever, it means, I, I looked it up, I didn't know it. It means that this is something you actively do. It's something you actively do. It's not something that will naturally or um, automatically come to you. You don't naturally go, oh, this is wonderful, Lord. Thank you for the trials. Thank you for the sufferings. Yay! You don't normally do that. You should actively make a choice. Make a choice. And listen, it takes great faith. It really takes great faith to see beyond the natural circumstances and trust God enough to rejoice in it. So James says, count it all joy. Add it up. Count for those who know what the word count means. Accounting. Marky Summa. Calculate. Add it all up. And see them as joy. He's not saying that trials are a joy to go through. He's not saying that. He's not saying that, tri that we should be joyous about the trials. He says that the believers should count them as joy. We should be joyous in the trials. In the trials. So how is that even possible? How can a person count all the trials as joy? And I want you to know this. And it is very important that you remember this. You have to write it down somewhere in your Bible, somewhere. Somewhere. Just write this down. You must remember this. God is in the middle of your trouble. God is in the middle of a trouble. And we don't feel that way. Sometimes we feel God has forsaken me. God is far away from me. And I want to tell you that's not true. The Bible says I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And sometimes you're in the trial. You're actually in the will of God. Not always, but sometimes. Now Os Oswald, Oswald Chambers, you've probably heard about him before. He said the following, he said, To choose suffering makes no sense at all. 
To choose God's will in the midst of our suffering makes all the sense in the world. Makes all the sense in the world. When you come to rea the realization that God is, is in the midst of my trouble, that God is in control even when you, the circumstances seems to be out of control, only then will you find a reason to joy. Only then. James is not saying that trials are joyful in and of themselves, but what he's getting at is that they are joyful when you know they are under the authority of a sovereign God who accomplishes His purposes in them. You have to understand this. Your sufferings and your difficulties. Yeah, not so mad at Sufferings. Well, tell me. Your sufferings and difficulties are not without any purpose. You need to understand. It's not purposeless. And to know that God is working in the midst of your trouble and that He has a purpose is the first thing you have to understand when it comes to count it all as joy. Romans 8 Verse 28 and 29 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many Read and listen, God has a purpose for everything. In Romans 8 here, our purpose, our destiny is to be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. Yes, there may be other specific purposes in your specific trials or sufferings. Yes, that um, it might be different, but the main the purpose and focus of God is to change you to become like Jesus Christ. And He counts it all together as good. Now, I've used this example before. If you come to my house and I invite you for lacquer cupcakes, okay? Then I say, okay, sit. Here is a, 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 a little bit of flour. So open your mouth. <laughs> Eat. Okay. Here's a little bit of salt. Open your mouth. Salt. Okay. Open your mouth. Here's a little bit of oil, man. Eh? Oil. And an egg. There must be an egg. Raw, you know. Is it going to be nice? No. Uh, but if you put them all together, it makes a lovely cup. That's how Romans 8 always sticks with me. Verse 28. For we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good. In those singular things, it doesn't feel nice, but all things together is nice. Count them all as joy. So God has a purpose. He has a purpose and for us to get to that purpose, He has to change us. And that is our problem. We don't like change. We don't like change. He wants to conform us to His image. And we've been looking at Philippians a lot these last few weeks. And especially this week, we've been looking at Philippians 3 in the Bible studies. And let me just read verse 10 to 12. Is it big enough? Can you read? Yeah. It says that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share His sufferings. Hello. Becoming like Him in His death 
that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Paul is saying, I'm pressing on to make it my own. Verse 10, to know Him and the power of His resurrection. And that includes sharing in His sufferings. And do we really know what that means? Do we really understand what it means? God's goal for our lives is maturity in Him. And to get there, it includes sufferings. Do we understand that? And this is what makes it so much easier to deal with trials. To know that in suffering, God has a purpose. Hebrew 12 verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. To know that our faith being perfected includes sharing in His suffering. Knowing this makes us makes it so much easier and gives us reason to rejoice. I'm looking at the time and I'm still far away. So please forgive me this morning. Verse 3 says, Why? Verse 3 says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Why trials? So that our faith is tested. You see the genuineness, genuineness, genuineness of our faith is tested by how we stand up in times of trouble. You see, James is writing to the first believers of the Jerusalem church who were scattered, who were persecuted, and that he's writing to them because of their faith. He is writing this letter to encourage them these difficulties are not irrational. They are tests. There is a purpose in them. God is in the midst of your trouble. God wants to refine your faith. That's what's happening. The word testing refers to the process by which gold are purified. The word in Greek for testing. In order to separate the gold from the dross, the ore was placed in a furnace and heated until it melted, the dross rose to the surface and was skimmed off, leaving only pure gold. For those, those who are in the mining knows how this works. Pure gold. And listen to what Job said in Job 23, verse, it's Job 23, not Job 3. I see a mistake. It's Job 23, verse 10. He says, He knows the way that I take when He has tested me, I will come forth as gold. That's what God wants from our faith. He wants to test us to bring the gold out. To bring the gold out. So, should we resist trials? No. They are tests to purify our faith, to bring forth gold. They are essential Trial, sufferings, difficulties are essential to your growth. They are tests of your faith that will produce steadfastness. That is the fixed direction. And in the face of difficulties, you do not abandon the direction. You do not forsake the, that purpose, that direction. You hold on. Paul Tripp said the following, he said, the principle is God will make you where you haven't intended to go in order to produce in you what you could not achieve on your own. Lord, I didn't foresee this, anticipate this. You know what? God will take you to where you did not plan to go. We make plans, God establishes our steps. Mm -hmm. Trials are not always all bad. Sometimes trials, listen carefully what I'm saying, sometimes trials 
He is grace that comes to you in uncomfortable forms. Did you hear that? Sometimes trials is grace that comes to you in a form that makes you uncomfortable. We have to understand that in the midst of our trials, God did not leave us. He did not forsake us. He is in there. He is at work. He is busy with us. He is working in us to change us. And let's be honest, we would rather be comfortable than holy. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. God wants to produce steadfastness in us. Other translations, patience. Patience is a virtue. He wants to produce in patience in our lives. He wants to produce in us faith that endures. Faith that endures. In other words, God is in the business of building <coughs> tough people <coughs> for us, for Him. He wants people that has faith that endures. Let's jump to verse 4. I see the time is running out. There's no watch there, so don't worry. And Verse 4 says, And let steadfastness, patience, have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The King James Version says it this way. He says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, lacking in nothing. So trials are tests of our faith, and it it works patience, it works endurance, it, and endurance leads to perfection. Now the Greek word perfect that we find in that verse is the word let me just run it there I'll put it up there, teleon and it means to be mature. Okay? So it's not saying patience leads to perfection in, in the way that I'm perfect now. No, sinless. I act as perfect. It's not saying that. This word delay means maturity. It leads to maturity. Spiritual maturity in this case. One day, and listen, one day at the resurrection, Romans 8, we will be redeemed from this body of death and we will be saved from the presence of sin. But this is not this perfect James is referring to. He's referring to spiritual maturity in this life. So the Greek word for perfect is to lay on to be mature. The Greek word for complete is interesting. I love this. Holokleroi. That means to be whole. So God wants you to be mature. God wants you to be whole. He wants to heal you and make you whole. Okay. Are you following me? Yes. He wants to bring wholeness in our lives. So if you're in the time of suffering, just trust God. He's busy at work. He's, he wants to provide um, wholeness. He wants to give you maturity. And it also says lacking in nothing. Meaning that in the trial, in the midst of suffering, you're not alone. God will provide. Not lacking in anything. He... He will provide everything that you need to remain obedient in the, your life of faith. So can faith endure? Yes, it can endure. God will provide everything. Why can I say that? Why can I say, count it all joy? Because God is working. 
And if you don't understand that God is in the midst of your trials and your sufferings, and He has a purpose for you, to mature you, to complete you, then you can't have joy in your suffering. So let me close. We can't always know why things happen the way they do in our lives. No matter how hard we try to figure out things, there will always be mysteries in life, many mysteries in life, but we can know this for sure, that God is at work in our trials, and it is for our benefit, and it is to the glory of God. Always can know that. We can't choose our trials, nor can we avoid most of them, but we can choose how to respond in those trials. That part is up to us. When James says to the Jewish believers, I see what happened, but you know what? Count them as joy because God is using you miraculously. Look what's happening. You're spreading the word of God. People is getting saved. Let's be honest, if we are going through trials, we want to get out of that trial as quick as possible. Am I right? We always want to fix the circumstances, but we have we ever thought that you might be in the middle of God's will? Instead of praying, Lord, take away these difficulties, save me from these trials, maybe you should pray, Lord, we know we are not alone and you are at work in us to produce in us endurance, patience. Give us the strength, Lord, and may we be stronger at the end. Maybe we should pray. You know when Jesus prayed when he was in the garden of Gethsemane? He said, Lord, please take this cup away. But not my will. But your will be done. God could have taken away the cup. But Jesus had a purpose. He had a purpose. That brings me to Hebrew 12. And I'm ending with this verse. I want to show you this. You might have seen this before. Hebrew 12 verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Listen carefully what he said. Who for the joy. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him because he knew why. He knew why. And I'm telling you this morning, the why. Because God's got a purpose. <coughs> Let's just trust God in the suffering and in the trials. Father, thank you. Thank you that we can just confess to you this morning that in many trials, many sufferings, We've questioned your methods. We've questioned your motives. We even sometimes run away from church and from, from the community of believers running away because we do not understand why we are going through what we are going through. And Lord, may we just get this perspective this morning knowing that you are in the midst of the trials and you are working in us to bring in us to endurance patience, long-suffering, so that we can become stronger, mature, whole. I pray for those in this audience this morning who are going through a difficult time. May we set our eyes on the goal. Looking unto Jesus, the perfecter and the finisher of our faith. May we just realize this morning as the song we sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace.
thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.